So good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Raul Rosenthal. I apologize for the informal appearance. I happen to be on vacation. I escaped Miami to stay away from the hurricane and left Dr. Newman uh, at the Cleveland Clinic taking care of everything. So Martin uh, seems to be surviving the hurricane on the east coast of Florida. And today we have a phenomenal panel. Dr. Alberto Rancati, who is a world-renowned uh, plastic surgeon uh, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dr. Martin Newman, equally internationally known for plastic surgery uh, at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in Western Florida. And Dr. Fernando Deep, who doesn't need much of an introduction when we talk about fluorescent imaging. He's probably the most glowing physician in the world that shines with or without ICG. Um, so uh, without any further delay, we're gonna get started. And uh, Fernando, who is first on the row? So we're going to start to go through the presentations. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start and then I'm going to let uh, Alberto and, and Martin talk. So can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, I wanna say one more thing before you get started. We have 42 participants. Please use the chat room uh, or the Q&A so that we can interrupt the speakers and ask them questions uh, so that this becomes really entertaining. It's late in the afternoon for you guys in the evening, so you might be tired. We're going to make this uh, an enjoyable webinar. So, Fernando, go ahead. Okay. okay, we decided to talk about the use of ICG in oncoplastic surgery because, you know, this technology is really getting accepted around the world. And in my opinion, it's, it's going to become a standard of care pretty soon. And we're going to show you why. So um, this, we're going to, to go uh, through these topics, uh, basically how this technology works. If you decide to use it uh, in your OR, what you, you really need. Um, the understanding of the, the anatomy, what's uh, going on with the uh, evaluation and the visualization of the anatomy, the breast uh, anatomy, basically. The staging in, in breast cancer, uh, we're going to see how well we can see the sentinel lymph nodes uh, with this uh, technology. Something that it's pretty new and, and we are starting a, a new trial, the axillary dissection guided the fluorescent using this technology. What, what about the reconstruction? And then, you know, how we can evaluate basically the complication after a breast uh, surgery. And what is, uh, this is the current state of the technology and then what is going to happen in the future. So uh, when we talk about fluorescent eye surgery, you know, we, we know that this uh, more and more papers are, are being published every day. And the reason why is because more surgeons uh, have uh, the equipment in the OR and we are learning more about the technology. So in order to, uh, you know, produce this, to use this technology, we basically need a light source. And the reason why is because the dye that we are going to use um, to produce fluorescence is in the sign in green. In the sign in green is going to receive the, the uh, wavelengths of the uh, 780 nanometers from the light source. It's going to glow. So uh, what I was saying is that okay. basically what we need as a camera is a tumor structure that we want to see and a light source. The dye that we use is in the sign in green, a very renowned uh, and a very common dye, uh, very safe. And this is very important when we want to uh, develop or use a, a new technology. This is really very uh, known by everybody that is using the, the technology. Uh, it, the in the sign in green was developed many years ago in 1957, uh, tested in humans in the Mayo Clinic. Uh, it has been used for different uh, applications, not specifically uh, with um, fluorescence for in order to evaluate liver function and also angiography for uh, retinal veins. It is not metabolized in the human body and rapidly removed. We have been using this uh, technology for years and I haven't seen any kind of adverse effect 
And in the, 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 and the reason why it's because the incidence of uh, allergies is really very low. So these are the equipments that uh, we are using now in the OR. Um, one is the elevation IR that it can be used for laparoscopic, so minimal invasive surgery, and also for open procedures. And the other one is the IC flow that you know has a camera that is very easy to use and we can use for open procedures. So I'm going to let uh, um, Alberto talk about why, why this technology is really very important uh, to understand the uh, vessels and the vascularization of the, the breast. Alberto? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Fernando. Um, as you know, uh, when we talk about complications in breast surgery and to today with the standard of care of, of nipple sparing mastectomy, it is important to, to go back to basics in anatomy. Uh, to understand why we can lower our incidence of complication. And so let me take a minute to, to explain the vascularization of the breast. And it's important to know where the vessels come to keep alive our nipple area complex after a nipple sparing mastectomy. And uh, when we talk about uh, perforator vessels, uh, the breast uh, has some characteristics because uh, you have the second perforator, which is a branch from the internal mammary artery, from the subclavian artery, uh, the third, the fourth, the fifth perforator with three branches, the medial intercostal artery perforator, the anterior intercostal artery perforator in our six at the meridian of the breast, the LICAP, which is the lateral intercostal artery perforation, and the lateral thoracic, which is uh, an artery which comes from the axillary artery so uh, why is this important? Because the, the second perforator and the fifth with these three branches together with the lateral thoracics are those who are outside the breast footprint. When you make a mastectomy, you cut the third and the fourth perforator and what keeps uh, the flaps alive are the second and the fifth. And this is important uh, because we have studied that in, in, in cadavers uh, with latex injections. But when you see this uh, with ICG, uh, it, it's really uh, understandable why you, you need to make a planning and a mapping of the perforators and where to place your incision. And we have changed our way of making nipple sparing mastectomy after Fernando introduced us with the ICG technology. So uh, we are very grateful because we have lowered our incidence of complications, just placing an incision laterally to the hour six. We previously, we made an incision in the inframammary fold, taking all the inframammary fold to be comfortable to make the, the mastectomy. And today we know that if we cut just uh, sacrificing the light cap and we leave the eye cap and the second perforator, we are safe uh, in, 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 in keeping alive our nipple area complex. So just uh, looking at some of the images, uh, Fernando, can you, can you go ahead with the next? Uh, so next, here you see an arteriography and here you see where you see the second perforator, how it goes in between the skin and the gland in the fat uh, that covers the, the gland. So it is important uh, for this, when you see this, and when you uh, make the ICG uh, images after the mastectomy to preserve the vascularization. So you, when, when you see the dynamic flow uh, with the ICG, you know that you are making a, a good mastectomy, leaving all these perforators that will uh, keep you on the safe zone, uh, avoiding complications and nipple uh, complex necrosis, which is one of the most feared complications for the breast surgeon. And the next, can you go ahead? That's it. That's how we make the planning and mapping and marking for a nipple sparing mastectomy patient. So uh, with the Doppler, we find the second you see that is outside the breast footprint. These black dots are showing the, the breast footprint, just pressing the breast 
to the thorax. So you find the second one, the third and the fourth that you will cut them when you make the mastectomy. And we leave uh, the inframammary fold intact. That's why it's important not to over dissect and, and after the mastectomy outside the breast footprint because you will cut the second perforator. And you can check this previous to the mastectomy and after the mastectomy to check the vitality of the flaps. So just placing the incision laterally to our six, where you have the eye cap, you have uh, the possibility of making a comfortable mastectomy and safer just lateralizing the incision over cutting the, the light cap and not the eye cap, which is very important. The next. So as I was telling you, first you mark the breast footprint, you mark the incision, then you place your vessels with very easy with an ultrasound with a Doppler and you mark your perforators. And then you make the incision. It's an eight to 10 centimeters incision where you can make your mastectomy and you can uh, see after the mastectomy, the vitality of the tissues and the flaps. Next. So again, here you see, previous to mastectomy, you see the perforators, you know if you have a previous incision for a biopsy or something, uh, where to place the incision if you must change your planning uh, because the, the, some of these perforators are cut. Here you see how you can press and see the vascularization of the pillar complex. The next. Again, you see the vessels. So like this, you know, previous to surgery, how is the vascularization of the breast? And after nipple sparing mastectomy, and after placing the implant, we have made several studies with Fernando, uh, checking that the vitality of the nipple was good. And what were the vessels that we, we left after the nipple sparing mastectomy? And you can check that the vascularization is okay. And, and, and this is like the real anatomy, but looking at it live uh, in a movie. So it's amazing to, to see what's happening with these flaps when you make the ICG after the, the implant-based reconstruction in nipple sparing mastectomy. Next. Here you see, again, how you see the flow network around the nipple complex. Next. And again, evaluating, and, and this is in a sagittal cut, uh, you see the second, next. I keep going, third, fourth perforator, fifth perforator. So when you make the mastectomy and you take out the gland, uh, what keeps alive the nipple complex next is the second and the fifth because you cut the third and the fourth. Next. So again, the remaining vascularization after a nipple sparing when you have a tumor, next, is the second and the fifth preparator. Why uh, we, we are saying this so, so many times? Because it is very important to know that the remaining vascularization is just this, the second, the fifth, and the lateral thoracic vessel. So if, if you make a previous examination of the patient looking previous scars, biopsies, and you place the, in the good place the, the incision, you are diminishing the possibilities of necrosis of the flaps and the nipple complex. Next. Okay, well, we have made this um, evaluation and perfusion with uh, Fernando and Dr. Angrigiani and Dr. Dor. Here we see the mammogram, the patient uh, previous to, to make the mastectomy, or also when you make an, an just an augmentation, uh, it's better to place lateral incision and not in the over the eye cap in our six, because you have better sensation after the placement of an implant. And we are studying this. So here you see 
our mapping, the incision from the eye cap in our six to the lateral part, cutting the eye cap because there are no papers or reports that the light cap keeps vascularization of the nipperial complex. Next. Yeah, okay. Martin, uh, what do you think about the, the use of this kind of technology in vascularization, you know, and, and how to design uh, basically the incision? Uh, have you used this technology uh, for mapping the, the, the vessels or? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, <clears throat> first, I must say that that's great. Uh, that's a great presentation by Dr. Ancati. Um, he has uh, clearly demonstrated uh, the anatomy and um, how the surgeon can use the technology for preoperative planning. Um, there is some interpatient variability with the anatomy we've noticed. And we've also noticed more commonly than the interpatient variability is the variability among breast surgeons uh, that we work with. And I think that um, there are ways, even with the perfect preoperative planning, that things can go asunder uh, despite the best um, uh, plans of mice and men. Uh, for example, if during the uh, mastectomy, uh, there's excessive retraction uh, on the mastectomy flap, that could tear the capillary beds. And mm -hmm. we see that, and that has a pattern that we can identify. Um, if when we're putting in, for example, a tissue expander, uh, we overfill, uh, that can put pressure against the, uh, the newly created mastectomy flaps and uh, impede uh, both venous return and ultimately arterial inflow. So yes, the, uh, and that's very clearly demonstrated. Very, I congratulate you again. That's a very clear demonstration of how the uh, technology can be used for the preoperative planning, um, favoring the lateral inferior uh, lower outer quadrants uh, where the blood supply is naturally uh, not as robust, preserving the um, upper, inner, and um, lower inner quadrants where you'll, mm -hmm. you'll see perforators two and five. Um, so it's, a, it's an excellent technique. And uh, yes, we use that um, and it's been very helpful. What's the dose that you use, Martin, in order to evaluate the breast? Uh, because, you know, we are studying now in ISFGS in the society and we are asking different authors and, uh, you know, to contribute because we, we are writing guidelines. Some of them, you know, uh, say, okay, two milliliters, three milliliters of ICG followed by 10 cc of saline solution. What's your recommendation from some, for someone that is starting with this technology to evaluate? It's a good question. Know, Thank you. So um, my protocol is, uh, has been developed over the years and it's a function not only of what we've learned on the operating room table, but also the, the manufacturers um, of the dye. So for example, most of us will get uh, 10 cc's of dye to play with in a case. So what we've done is we've divided that into three shots, three, three cc shots, leaving one cc extra for, tissue, for a fluid that's lost in the barrel of the needle, or, or dropped here or dropped there. When I walk in the room, um, this is post, post mastectomy, I'll go ahead and I'll give three cc's and I'll flush it with 10 cc's. I'll then go ahead and intervene based on the findings. So for example, if the margins of the wound need to be debrided, we'll go ahead and do that. If, um, if something else needs to be done, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, then we'll go ahead and do our intervention, place a tissue expander, place a full-sized implant, whatever it may be, and we use the balance of the second three cc's to check our work. Very important to do that before leaving the operating room because sometimes you're surprised. Previously, I mentioned that it is possible to overfill a tissue expander and to cause venous congestion and ultimately arterial um, uh, compromise. And you may have done that with your intervention. So it's important to check. If you have done that, you'll see it. And then you'll go ahead and have three cc's left in your back pocket to use if you have to intervene again. So in the example I give, you've overfilled the tissue expander, simply take some fluid out. You still have three cc's. You go ahead and take a third image 
and that should give you the result that you're looking for. Do you use this routinely in your procedures? So you select the patients and you say, okay, this patient has a high risk of necrosis or I really want to see vascularization for something. Everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. The same way I put on my seatbelt before I, I drive my car, even if I'm going to the grocery store. You never know when you're gonna have a problem. You can never predict it with certainty. Certainly there are high risk patients, but knowing what normal looks like is critical. And only by using it on, in my opinion, every patient, do you get a good sense of what normal looks like so that when you encounter abnormal, it's clear as a bell. Well, thank you very much, Martin. So we're going to move to the next topic. Um, probably you have that, that has a lot of experience in Sentinel lymph node, want to go ahead and explain us why this is important in Sentinel lymph node evaluation or how you use it. Uh, you want to go ahead? Martin? I'm sorry, myself? Yeah. Certainly. Um, I use uh, uh, ICG for sentinel lymph node mapping primarily for melanoma. Not being a breast oncologist, I don't really have the op opportunity to use it for uh, sentinel lymph node and breast surgery, uh, but I think it's an excellent idea and the data certainly supports it. Um, I can't speak 100% to it, but generally you can go ahead and inject one cc of ICG in and around the nipple areolar complex, and that can be very effective in identifying the sentinel lymph node. I'll tell you that when you do use ICG to identify a sentinel lymph node, whether it be in melanoma or in breast cancer, it's night and day compared to the other technologies we have. There is absolutely no comparison. Um, it is inherent. It is, it lights up like a Christmas tree. Uh, and it is something that I will not do a set in a lymph node without at this point. Yeah, I want to show you uh, how we do it uh, here. Uh, basically what it we do is possible. exactly it what you described. Uh, you know, we prepare the ICG, ICG at the beginning. Then uh, we administrate uh, one cc, you know, around the uh, the areola, and then uh, we follow the basically the, the vessels. One of the reasons why I started to use it routinely is because sometimes we don't have the technetium and, and it's more complicated. And also uh, something that uh, we learn from this technology is that we can see the lymph vessels. And this is something that we cannot do basically with the technetium. So uh, we put together um, ISFGS and, and Kevin White uh, put together a, a, a review of the literature, a very extended review, 39,000 abstracts, uh, because we wanted to really, we, we know that we have the standard of care that it has been uh, for a long period of time, the technetium, and we wanted to see, okay, where are we with this technology, you know, using ICG? And the results are really amazing. Um, you know, I'm going to show you the, the results here. He analyzed uh, seven European trials, 16 Asian, one from the US, uh, a lot of different studies uh, from different parts of the world. And I believe this is really uh, very important because this is not, this uh, avoids the results from the bias. And if you look, and, and he also compared uh, the ICG versus the blue dye, the ICG versus the radioisotope, and the ICG versus both uh, methods. And if you look at the numbers, uh, just the comparison uh, between the ICG and the blue dye, you know, the, the rate of the sentinel lymph nodes identification um, uh, with the ICG is like between 95 and 100%. And this is something that we already knew that the blue dye, the identification with the blue dyes between the 80, 75%. Uh, so, uh, and then when we compare them, and these results for us are, are really uh, amazing, is the comparison between the ICG and the radio stove demonstrate that uh, the, we can use the ICG uh, as much as the technetium. And, and we are uh, we can make sure that we are going to find uh, the sentinel lymph node when we talk about uh, breast cancer. 
uh, and this is a not at least a non inferiority uh, study. This is a comparison between both of them, and if we compare the ICG and versus the radioisotope and the the blue dye, also we see that the um, it's it's uh, very similar uh, the results. So that's why we are starting to implement uh, in the center that we are putting together here in, in Argentina, the, the Sentinel lymph node identification with ICG, you know, in all our patients. And here you have all the different papers that report the, uh, the percentages or the rate of identification uh, of the Sentinel lymph node with ICG. And look at the numbers, you know, 95%, 96, 97, 100%. This is really, really uh, very useful. And then uh, the analysis was divided per case sentinel lymph node identification detection rate. Uh, those sentinel lymph nodes that were positive for can cancer and those that was false negative, you know, and all of the three analyses were in favor uh, to this, the use of ICG. Per case, 97% versus uh, you know, 94 uh, or 85%. Cancer, the, the nodes that were positive also were more ident identified with ICG compared to the other methods. And, you know, when we are talking about false negative rate, 4.3%, this was lower in the ICG compared to the other ones. Something, something for us that is really very important is what's, what about cost for us? You know, using technetium it's really expensive, and uh, the use of ICG when we divide it per patient or the dose that we use is much cheaper. And this is exactly what you were describing. And I, I, you know, if you do it the same way, we we evaluate, uh, we we put the patient asleep, and once the patient, you know, uh, we can start working with the patient then uh, we administrate the ICG and we try to follow the lymph vessels. And when we see a stop there, then we open, we cut the skin and we find the uh, sentinel lymph node there. And also something that we can see is the, uh, where the lymph vessels are going, if they're going to the axilla or they're crossing uh, the, the chest. Here, here you have an example. Uh, we have different kinds uh, of equipment. Alberto at the beginning uh, showed uh, the different modes that we can use. This is the black and white mode. Sometimes we can use an overlay. Uh, Martin, you use uh, the black and mode uh, um, mode compared to the other ones more, or you know the other ones. I do. I prefer the uh, grayscale image um, over everything because I kind of trained with it, and uh, you know that's how we develop the technology. All the overlay modes have come later and are helpful to, to, to many. Um, but to me, this is as black and white as you can get. It's a crystal clear. Uh, you take that node, you remove it, you put it on a back table, you take a picture of it, and there is absolutely no question. Uh, it's very inherent. Um, it's excellent for the trainees who may not be sure. I can't, I, I'm sure that most of the people on this call trained with blue dye and, and as, as young surgeons, we looked and we said, blue, I don't know, I think it's blue, maybe it's blue, but there's never any question here as to what we're looking at. And your numbers uh, are impressive. Uh, they support what we know clinically, uh, that this is a superior way to do this. It's a better mousetrap, so to speak. And with all the literature that you have reviewed and that you have shown uh, supporting this, it's just a matter of time before this becomes standard of care. It's better. It's better yeah. for the patient, it's better for the doctor, and it's better for the hospital. So uh, we have a, thank you very much, Martin. We have a, a question from Elisa York. Uh, she's from Madrid. And she says, uh, we are performing full endoscopic fluorescent guided axillary lymph node dissection for locally advanced breast cancer. Three centers currently performing this technique, Madrid, we, uh, with very promising results. Thank you very much for the, the comment, uh, Elisa. We're going to show how uh, also um, we can see the nodes during a, a, a dissection. 
But if you want to uh, comment a little bit more uh, about this, Elisa, you are well, more than welcome. Alberto, what's, what's your opinion about the use of the sentinel lymph node in breast cancer? Yeah, I, I think that uh, there will be no place for other method to do this in the future. Uh, it's uh, so easy and you feel so precise uh, with your maneuvers and uh, for the patient it's a more comfortable post-op because you, you don't make a dissection, you just go straight ahead uh, where you see the image. So uh, today if, if I get an a, 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 a sentinel node on myself, I would not allow another method than this. Well, thank you very much. So you have here- And uh, just, to, I just wanna echo what, what Alberto said, just speaking to that point, when your dissection is cleaner and more focused, you do less trauma to the adjacent lymphatics. One of the things I think we can look at as time goes by is the incidence of lymphedema following mm -hmm. this method versus the previous methods. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, this is a, another case where we can see uh, the afferent vessel and the node with the, with the vessel there. So uh, we are cutting just, you know, very close to the node and we are protecting the tissue, exactly uh, what, uh, you know, you are saying. And we are honestly, uh, I, I prefer to use the, this, the overlay honestly, because I have an equipment that I can see when I am operating. And sometimes, you know, with a, a black and white image, even though it is more accurate and we can see a little bit more the fluorescence, you know, sometimes it doesn't allow us to, uh, to operate. Um, uh, axillary dissection. So you have any experience in guiding the axillary dissection or, or some dissection with uh, just um, making the, the uh, nodes fluorescence or, or not? Hey, Martin? Um, well, again, I'm not a breast oncologist, so I don't do this, uh, but I know that you can go ahead and isolate those lymph nodes that are specific to the breast as opposed to lymph nodes that may be coming from the upper extremity by injecting ICG in the breast uh, and if you want, you can uh, inject a, another dye uh, into the upper extremity and you can distinguish which is which. So for those individuals who are undergoing a axillary lymphadenectomy, um, it would be better, I presume, in the long run, it's common sense, not to take lymph nodes that are not going to be involved. You want to mm -hmm. focus on the lymph nodes that drain the breast and not the lymph nodes that drain the upper extremity which are located adjacent to each other. So by using ICG, you can specifically target those lymph nodes and your lymphadenectomy can become more specific to the breast cancer as opposed to, let's just take it all and see what we get. Yeah, that, that, so, that's, very, that, that's very interesting, Martin, because also when you see if you put blue in the arm and uh, green in the breast, uh, if they... Uh, you see that some lymph nodes get both. Those are the patients that are at risk for lymphedema. So uh, in, in those patients where you need to take out those nodes that also drain the, the, the arm is where you must plan something as a, a lymphovenous anastomosis or microsurgery or something because you know that this is the patient at risk for lymphedema. So it's, it's very interesting the, 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 what you can open in the future for with this technique also. And there are people who are doing the prophylactic uh, lympho, uh, lymphovenous transfers, uh, lympho, uh, lymphovenous anastomoses at surgery uh, to reduce the risk of the onset uh, down the line, putting out the fire before it happens. Yeah. Thank you very much. So Ricardo Calderon agrees with, with, with what you are saying. Uh, please tell us where you are from. Uh, Joel Banuelos Flores says, what time after ICG injection do you explore the axilla? Martin? It happens very quickly, within a minute or two. Um, I wouldn't run uh, because the dye will stay in the nodes for quite some time. 
Um, but I don't think it takes very long, five minutes at the most. Yeah. So Elisa, you uh, has experience in, in notes dissection. When adding low pressure CO2 to the dissection, it becomes uh, even more precise. We believe it will reduce lymphedema. You can probably avoid being aggressive in your harvesting. The lymph nodes are not fluorescent. So totally agree. I'm going to show you here a, a video that, that we put together uh, and this is something that we are uh, starting now. We, we don't have a lot of experience. There's not much published in the literature. This is uh, uh, basically we administrate the ICG, not in the OR this time. We administrate uh, the ICG 12 hours before the procedures. Uh, so in order to have all the nodes with ICG and not the sentinel lymph nodes. So, um, and, and it's, it's really uh, very easy to perform. And we open the, when we open the axilla, we can see exactly where the nodes are. Uh, and this is a, a way uh, also to evaluate and, and to uh, avoid leaving uh, nodes there and also to protect uh, the, the lymph vessels and not to dissect too much or, or more that we need to. Uh, and uh, this is something that, that uh, we are studying, and this is uh, uh, exactly what Elisa was saying. So you both are plastic surgeons, and, and, and we are going to talk about a little bit about complication after breast surgery. So Alberto, um, uh, what do you think about the use of this kind of technology in evaluating the perfusion of the flaps? Uh, yes, of course. I, I think today is a must when you are uh, tailoring the flaps uh, to be sure that uh, you, you have good vascularization before closing and leaving the OR. Uh, today, I, I, I would feel scared to make something without seeing it, not, not only uh, to feel it or to make all methods of, of, of trying to, to get information just with your forceps over the flap. Uh, you need to see it. And also from the legal point of view, I think it's important to have all these images recorded when you have a, cons a complication. Another interesting thing, uh, I think, and we are we are working with Fernando, it's over when, when you make the, the, for example, the contralateral breast uh, symmetrization in, in, in secondary breast reductions, uh, you can have a, a, a bad time if you don't know what was the pedicle first and with this technique you can identify this uh, prior to surgery so you know what kind of of uh, reduction you are going to do with a superior pedicle or inferior pedicle or a medial one uh, if, if you don't have the information because you didn't make the the first reduction so i think it's it's so useful uh, not only to evaluate the, the flat because this is uh, have been published several times, uh, but in today with the uh, conservative mastectomies with nipple sparing and in skin reducing, uh, you need to know uh, the, the vitality of your flaps. So I think it, it's a must to use it. Uh, Martin, you use it routinely or again, um, you know, sometimes. Uh, what's going on in Cleveland Clinic? We do not do a uh, immediate breast reconstruction without um, this technology. It just isn't done. There's no reason for it. Um, we have the technology. Uh, it has cut our uh, complication rate, our flat necrosis rate, from the 25 to 30% um, that you have on the uh, screen uh, down to uh, low single digits, if not zero. And it is just. Uh, it's just something that doesn't have to occur anymore. Uh, you know, as a surgeon, I still get phone calls at two o'clock in the morning for Tylenol. I still see infections. I still see um, seromas, but we don't see flap necrosis. It just, it's virtually eliminated it. Mm -hmm. And again, you don't know when it's gonna happen. Uh, so if, to prepare for it, you just do it with everybody and, um, you to breed, you downsize. There are cases where I delay, where I'm uh, the, the you know, smoker, a diabetic, an obese on steroids or something, a really poor candidate. We give them a chance. And there are times where I have said, gee, that flap looks pretty bad. And uh, I was getting ready to pack it in. 
And the resident says to me, well, just take a picture of it with your, your, your toy there. Maybe, maybe you'll learn something. And I've been surprised because sometimes even it doesn't necessarily always tell me to take away or to breed or to downsize or to deflate. Sometimes it encourages me to proceed where I want to uh, delay the case. So I use it on all my cases how and it's an times, invaluable tool. How many times, you know, you really believe on the technology and say, okay, you know, I don't see really this glowing so much and going to change or cut, you know, a little bit more. It happens, you know, how many times you change your practice basically? Almost, almost always. <laughs> so I'm always, I'm almost always intervening in some respect, whether I, uh, go to the operating room with the plan to go direct to implant and then change to put a tissue expander in. Whether I notice marginal uh, ischemia and I debride the wounds along the margin. Whether or not I put in fluid and I've overfilled and I have to take out fluid. I'm always doing something based on the images of, on the feedback I get. And it is a, an operation that evolves. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So we know that, you know, we can see flat pedicles location and just so much. This is what has been published really in the literature. Uh, and this is how well we can, uh, you know, see. Uh, nowadays, this does not have to happen. Uh, no, no. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there is uh, like more to explain or, or show us. Uh, you know, how they reduce the, the complication rates. And, and this is, seems to be the same numbers that the literature uh, described. Dugal, incidence of kidney cross is lower from 23 uh, to 13%, an unexpected reoperation. Again, you know, a, a statistical significant uh, change. You know, there is uh, some literature now that are talking about, okay, we are describing the images subjectively, you know, how well does it glow or not? But there is some equipment now that are developing software in, in order to evaluate numbers. So to evaluate, okay, from that percentage, you know, uh, you may have a necrosis uh, or not. How important is Martin and Alberto, the use of quantification to really understand this technology? Well, we we were uh, we worked with um, a company a while ago developing a uh, a quantification system, and some of the questions that came up is how do you quantify? Uh, the light in the room may be different, the patient temperature may be different, uh, the the O two sat may be different from patient to patient, blood pressure may be different at same patient different times. So what we learned how to do was use a Kind of a relative perfusion. We picked a spot on the patient that had what we would call 100% perfusion, even at a low pr blood pressure in a, in a cool patient. Um, we, whatever that was, that was 100%. And then we would follow the blood flow from that, and we would take a percentage of it. This is 50% ideal, this is 25% ideal, this is 10% ideal, whatever. And we, we looked at that in a retrospective fashion. Similarly, some of our colleagues at Emory were doing the same study in a prospective fashion. And again, the numbers came out almost identical. Anything less than about 25% of a, a relative perfusion was considered poor and almost guaranteed to have a problem. Whereas anything greater than a 40 or 50% uh, perfusion was considered to be very good and unless the patient went home and smoked cigarettes, you should have a pretty good outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so it is very helpful. It's helpful sometimes late at night when you're not sure. Uh, it, it's helpful when you're training residents. It's helpful when you're getting different signals from the turgor or the color or the capillary refill, and you want yet another tool in your armamentarium to help you make decisions. Overall, it is helpful. And what's your number? So uh, you mentioned, you know, the relative numbers. So uh, when you consider, you know, it's a number that you say, okay, you know, this may, uh, might have a necrosis. So 50%, 60%, 40%, 25%, 
What, what's the, the number that, that you consider it's important? In my practice, with my equipment, in my hospital, anything less than about 25% uh, is very concerning. And should, you should do something, should not let that out of the operating room. Anything above around 45, 50% should do fine. For the gray area between, you use the, your other clinical judgment, your other clinical parameters, capillary refill, turgor, bleeding edges, et cetera. Thank you very much. So um, here, you know, what the literature uh, teach us is that ICG guided uh, excision showed the trend in the reaction of trauma, flab necrosis again, uh, 14 versus 24, uh, 22%. And flap loss, 1.4% uh, versus 3.4%. And uh, something that is really very important when we introduce a new technology, I believe, is that if it is time consuming or not. You know, and, and we learn uh, from this technology and, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, it's there. You don't need, you know, you, it does not require 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Just with a couple of minutes, uh, you can perform it. So it's not going to change the workflow basically. And uh, something that a lot of countries, uh, you know, the concern of a lot of surgeons is, okay, the cost. And even though we need to spend, uh, you know, money and, and to buy equipment and to buy the ACG, also we found it in the literature that it has been demonstrated that if you prevent a flap necrosis, you're saving a lot of money. And learning from you, Martin, that, uh, you know, you decrease the rate of complications, uh, you know, we, we can tell that basically using this technology, we are saving money. So is this uh, what I'm saying is true or what, what do you believe? Oh, absolutely. And the analyses have been done. It, they, if you take a look at the cost of a complication and you take a look at the cost of using this technology on every case, you're going to save money by using it on every case because the cost of a complication is uh, far outweighs uh, both the tangible and the intangible costs, the actual dollars and cents, um, as well as the intangibles. For example, we all know to, to today's environment in the States, everybody's talking about medical economics and quality uh, over, uh, over cost, which is uh, value in our, in our system. And to improve value, you either increase quality or you decrease costs. And this technology actually does both. It increases the quality by reducing the take backs and the mastectomy, flap necrosis, the infections, the intangibles, such as pay for, for performance. You know, everybody's looking at numbers today. And if you have a take back or a return to the operating room or return to the emergency room within 30 days of a uh, of a case, you know, that, that actually costs the hospital money. And it doesn't just cost the money on that particular reimbursement. It's across the board, these penalties. So the cost savings are phenomenal. And uh, we don't look at things in a penny wise pound foolish fashion anymore. We look at the big picture. And when you look at the big picture, regardless of the study that you, you, you pull, uh, most will favor using this technology just the way we all put on our seatbelts when we get in our car. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really very clear. So um, uh, we are uh, also studying the, the flaps, and this is a, 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 a flap evaluation that, that uh, we did. Uh, and this is, you know, how you can see it in, in real time. Uh, we did this with uh, Dr. Languciani and Dr. Rancati, and you can see there, you know, the black areas uh, that Martin uh, was explaining us before. So, uh, in order, you know, it's uh, we are close to to the hour, and let's touch a, a little bit the last two topics of the night. So, what about complications? Uh, Alberto, what do you think about the use of this technology in the lymphedema uh, evaluation? And, and Martin, what's your experience uh, in, in this? I, I think it's, it's so interesting because uh, as uh, Martin was telling us uh, about this possibility of uh, identifying uh, the, the lymphatics from the arm and the lymphatics from the breast, uh, when, when you make this study previous to surgery, you can be prepared to, for anything. So 
from uh, again from the insurance companies and I, I think it will be something that will be required in every patient uh, in the next future uh, because uh, it, it improves quality safety and time so uh, I, I think that there is uh, nothing so advanced this moment uh, for for savings for for the patient uh, la like studying this to prevent lymphedema which is uh, also very costful for the patients in the in the long term so if you can prevent this uh, it's a great advance martin likewise it can also be looked at as a treatment for those who have unfortunately uh, had this uh, occur to them uh, we know that there are different causes of lymphedema. Uh, heretofore, there has been no surgical solution to this terrible, terrible life-limiting problem. Uh, but we've been learning. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think the Charles procedure is a reasonable uh, fix for this problem. But we've been learning uh, first with the lymphovenous bypasses, and now with this technology, how to identify the lymphatics, how to clearly visualize them how to diagnose whether or not they're open or whether or not they're sclerotic. And if they are open, there are things we can do. And if they're sclerotic, there are things we can do. So this technology has helped us, again, provide to four has been a, a life limiting problem for which there was no surgical solution. Thank you very much. So. Uh, for the audience, you know, I'm going to, to show you how we do it. We administrate 0.2 milliliters of ICG subcutaneously uh, in between uh, the fingers. Uh, and then we start looking very quickly uh, at the lymphatics. So something that we are doing now is after we operate an axilla, uh, we start mapping the patients. Uh, in a prospectively way. This is a linear pattern. This is a normal pattern. Uh, and this is how all the patients, you know, uh, should be, uh, you know, at, at the beginning. And we are trying to detect uh, if we can basically see uh, those, you know, those lymph vessels that are dilated uh, or that, you know, new um, vessels in order to start uh, early therapy. We know that with the ICG, we can have a different um, stratifications, linear, that is normal, splash, stardust, or, or diffuse. And we're going to manage the patient according uh, to that classification. And these are the different types of images that you can uh, capture uh, with the camera when you are evaluating a lymphedema. So uh, I think that this is really very important because if uh, the, the patient needs to be treated in a team, so once we, we treat the cancer and we do, uh, perform the sentinel lymph node, then we evaluate uh, the arms uh, of the patients. And if something happened after three months, six months, then we can treat them, uh, treat them and avoid uh, you know, a major lymphedema that we know that has no uh, solution. And this is how the lymph vessels, this is normal, and this is how it starts increasing the pressure inside the vessels and, and everything starts changing. Uh, and this is when we start. These are studies that, that we perform uh, here uh, and how you can see uh, very well uh, here the, the lymph vessels. This was an advanced stage. And in some cases, you can find those uh, linear uh, vessels. So uh, we treat them with uh, kinesiology. So something that we try to see here are not only the, the, the shape, uh, how the, the vessels are, so the new uh, vascularization. And we start treating you know, the patient according to the new uh, flow of the uh, lymphatics. And then something that we are start using, uh, and this is um, from Paola Chanez, that is uh, our kinesiologist. So she started using a uh, taping in order to treat this patient after evaluating them uh, with ICG. And, and you can see here, we put, uh, this is very interesting because 
we put um, here a mark uh, when the, the ICG stopped before the taping. And this is how the ICG uh, advanced through the arm uh, after uh, using the taping. And we can check it, uh, the, the progression of the ICG uh, with, a, with a, um, the, the taping, so the development of the, of the uh, improvement of the patient using ICG, basically. So do you have experience, Martin, on this, or, or Cleveland Clinic is using this? We have not used the taping, to my knowledge, in the surgical uh, divisions. I'm not sure if any of our physical therapists are using it or any of our vascular medicine doctors. It's actually the first time I've seen it. I'm very impressed. Yeah, and, and uh, this is other patients. And look at how, you know, the improvement of the patient uh, using this kind of uh, taping. And, and these, all these patients are evaluated, you know, with ICG. So we can evaluate if, if the patient is improving or it's not improving, not only clinically, but now we can understand better the anatomy. And, uh, you know, for the future, I have a couple of slides that I want to share with you. Uh, and, you know, now I believe because there was a question from Guatemala that it was asking about the margins of the tumor uh, of the breast cancer. So I believe that the future is going to be like being more, we need to be more specific. The ICG cannot really uh, identify uh, the margins of the breast uh, uh, cancer. Uh, very clearly, but uh, in, now a, a lot of uh, industries are, or companies are trying to develop specific dyes that are tagged to uh, specific tumors so we can see the margins. So there is different companies uh, like this one that can uh, use a dye, it can administrate, be administrated intravenously. And uh, then when you open the skin uh, and the breast, you can see them. It's not really very uh, sensi sensitive and, and specific, but you know, I believe in the future, uh, this is where we are going to go. So knowing exactly where are we uh, dissected. Uh, so, and something that we are studying uh, with uh, Raul is how to see nerves. And, and this is something that, you know, took our patient a couple of years ago uh, when you know, we try to see nerves not only for the axilla or for the neck, uh, and we develop a, a technology uh, because we saw that in almost all kind of procedures we may have an injury, and we know if you injure the lung thoracic uh, nerve, you you may have a, a wind scapula, and one of the ways uh, that you can see now is with also with fluorescence and no dye is involved there. So we use specific wavelengths and filters. At the beginning, we did a bench study, you know, where you can see very clearly the nerves, and then we tried in the uh, different areas of the uh, body, and this is a dissection of the axilla, and you can see here very well the nerve uh, glowing. So, you know, uh, just to finish, I, I would like to have your last comments. Uh, Alberto and Martin, what could you recommend to all the people that are starting with this technology? Uh, you know, you answer this, but again, routinely or selectively, uh, you know, what's the future according to your experience? Um, I think that uh, after looking at this, uh, anyone can see that the, the, the future of, for precision surgery is in fluorescence. Uh, I think that this last topic you mentioned about uh, nerve identification, it's, it's a game changer. Uh, if, if you can see today uh, conservative mastectomies, just not thinking about uh, to have uh, the nipera complex without uh, necrosis, but preserving sensation because you can see the nerves and you can preserve it not to repair it and to make microsurgery, just to preserve the nerves or in trauma or in prostate or uh, in, in head and neck. So I think this is the future. So for those that are uh, trying to, to see something new, I think uh, this is a technology to keep an eye on because uh, it will be 
the next step in, in precision surgery. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Martin, your last comments. Um, well, you asked, you know, to, to the new guys or guys who's just, just uh, kind of joining the club here. Um, residents have been coming out of training, learning and being exposed to this technology for 15 years now. So it really is very shortly going to become standard of care if it isn't. If you're just beginning to get used to it, however, you've been in practice for a while and, you know, you, the equipment has just hit your hospital. Um, I recommend you use it as much as possible uh, on both normal and abnormal, uh, low risk and high risk patients. It's important to become comfortable with the technology. It is extremely inherent. You don't, it's, the, the learning curve is very, very steep. Uh, a few cases in and you'll begin to get a good sense of what it is and you'll become addicted to it because it's like, I hate to say it, but it's kind of a blind man can see. You know, as, as Alberto said, he wants to see it. And once you see it, it's going to be very difficult not to see. As far as the nerves go, you know, there are certain applications that are just dying to, uh, to get this technology, prostate cancer, for example, to be able to remove the prostate and preserve the nerves, uh, critical. Um, uh, it's just, it's just um, something that if you haven't done yet, uh, talk to your hospitals, get the technology in, and uh, start using it. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to, to finish saying that I believe this uh, technology is uh, not, not only the future and that now we should start using right now because it's going to be a benefit. It's the present. Our, it's the present. You know, it's, it's, it's good for our patients. So it has been really a pleasure, uh, you know, to share this webinar with you both. Thank you very much for, for participating and, and uh, I I hope you you uh, will accept accept to you know to be with us in the next uh, webinars. Okay, thank you for uh, everybody for participating, and we wait all for you for for the next webinar. Thank you very much. You know, thank everybody. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. bye bye, Martin. Bye, Fernando. Thank you. Bye.